good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to go over the brief history and geography of Eswatini. And as you can see, Eswatini is a very small country. We are in southern Africa. Eswatini is bordered by Mozambique and South Africa. As you can see, it's landlocked almost totally surrounded by South Africa, except for this part of Mozambique. Um, it's a really loud night tonight. I don't know. I've been listening outside all night. I don't know what's going on tonight, but it's been a wild one, so we're just gonna relax and just enjoy the history of Eswatini. Just ignore whatever's happening outside. So, Eswatini. Like we said, it's a tiny little country landlocked in southern Africa. It has two very large mountain chains going through it. You can see right here, this is the Lebombo Mountains that go through its east. And through its west, you can't really see because it's a very large chain. You can only see the berg part of it. This is the Drakenberg Mountain that's very dominant on South Africa's east coast and sweep right through Eswatini. And you can see the highest point in Eswatini right here. This is Mlembe. And um, this half of the mountain range up here in Eswatini and in South Africa is known as the High Veld, like the Highland, right? And then um, in the middle part here, we have the Middle Veld and the low veld. Isn't that convenient? So, in between the Drakensberg Mountains and the Lipopo Mountains, we have the Lipopo Valley. And this is where the majority of Swazi people live. Those are people who live in Eswatini. They're called Swazi. Mainly in this area over here, you can see the capital city here of Mbambane. Mbambane. And, um, Eswatini technically has two capitals. This is the official one. Like if you were taking like a capitals of the world quiz, the answer would be Mbabane. But the real like historical capital of Eswatini is just to its south in Lobamba. Lobamba is where most of the government is and it's also where the king lives. And yes, Eswatini has a king talk about that in a minute. Uh, but actually the largest city is right over here. This is Manzini. So as you can see just all over here is where the majority of Swazi people live. The rest of the valley area has lots of rivers crisscrossing it between the mountains. It has lots of savanna grassland, especially in the low veld area. And um, Eswatini actually has a lot of national parks. You can see right here is the Hladne Park and lots of smaller ones all throughout. Um, Eswatini has a lot of wildlife. You can find the big five in Eswatini. Comment down below if you know any of the big five. I know my favorite. Let me grab them. The elephant. The big five. He might be a little dusty. That's not a bad thing. Sounds kind of nice to dust him off. He's been hiding over in the corner for a while because we haven't really had a lot of African elephant countries. It's Topol, the ASMR elephant. With the amazing ASMR ears. <laughs> Check it out. Let me put him by the microphone up here. The amazing ASMR elephant ears. Anyway. Elephants are one of the big five. Um, another very important one is the lion. The king of Eswatini is known as, oh, I just forgot it. It'll come back to me. It's Ingwanyama. There it is. Ingwanyama. If you watch African Kosa ASMR, uh, thanks to her, I know how to pronounce a lot of things in this country. And um, I've learned a lot of Kosa words from her, but. Um, they don't actually speak Kosa, but they use a lot of the same grammatical things in it. But um, Ingoyama is the name of the king. So let me talk about the royal family for a minute. 
before we get into history because it's very, very unique. Um, Eswatini is the last of the absolute monarchy kingdoms in Africa. They do have like a prime minister and a government that is elected, but the king has the absolute power over the country. And they, um, there's actually two different rulers in Eswatini. It's the king and his mother. I forget the name, the language, but she's known as the she-elephant. He's known as the lion. And um, it's not so much passed down like a traditional king to a prince, you know. Um, the king is allowed to have multiple wives. It's something that's not widely practiced in Eswatini anymore, but... Um, it's been that way since the, the Swazi people have existed, so that tradition has stayed. So when it's time to name the next king, they pick, um, you know, they, they look at the mother of the, the potential next ruler and then the next ruler because they rule together. And sometimes if the king's very young, the mother is the more important factor in choosing the next king. And... Um, the first two wives the king marries, uh, none of their sons can be king. I don't think he even has children with the first wife. That's like the ceremonial wife. It's all very complicated and convoluted. And it just, they've had, like I said, they've had a king since before <laughs> written history. And that they've had customs that they've preserved ever since. So there, there hasn't been a lot of changes to a lot of the ceremony. It's very interesting. The other thing before we get into history is, I know some of you are going, but isn't this country called Swaziland? And it was until about like four years ago now, the king changed it to Eswatini. We'll talk about that in its history. So let's just get into it. Let's talk about its history. So someone's outside. There are a lot of drunk people outside right before I started filming. <laughs> I don't know. So people have lived in this part of Africa, of course, since the dawn of time. The first human evidence in the borders of what is now Eswatini um, were found to be about 200,000 years old, and there is some really beautiful rock art that's found in Eswatini that's um, probably around 27,000 years old. and. The original people that lived in what is now Eswatini were the Khoisan hunter-gatherers. And af after a while, during the Bantu migration, um, people known as the Nguni came in and replaced them and developed farming and a couple of modern uh, techniques of living. And it wasn't until the 18th century that the Swazi people came in, or the Nguane people, they're also known as. So they lived um, around this area in Mozambique, and there was a lot of conflict there, and they got pushed out, and they had to find a new place to live. And the first king to rule in the borders of what is now Eswatini was Guane III, and um, th they've been there ever since. They've been the dominant one. Uh, they spent a lot of the like 1850s or so, incorporating the local peoples into their kingdom and trying to take up as much land as possible. But during that time, there was a lot going on in this corner of Africa. In particular, um, a lot of Dutch people known as Boers were settling into South Africa. And the British had a very, very strong political hold over the area as well. So during the scramble for Africa, the British were well aware of the king and his positive influence, and, you know, he wasn't opposed to the, like, they didn't fight against them. They weren't like the Zulu who were fiercely violent toward the British and the Boers and everything. So in 1881, the British recognized the independence of Swaziland, and the government consisted of the king and his mother. And then they had two different uh, groups of representatives from the British and the Dutch. And the three powers ruled over the land until in 1899, the second Boer War broke out between the Boer settlers and the British. And it was fought mainly in this corner of South Africa. So Eswatini got caught in the 
oh, I just blanked on the word in the crossfire. Um, there was one other interesting thing that happened during this war. Every year, if there is a king on the throne, there is a ceremony known as Inkwala. And it's um, kind of hard to describe. It's like uh, all the men in the kingdom come together and dance for the king and perform for them. And then the king gives a big speech and dances. And it is like the biggest um, holiday in what was Swaziland in the, the kingdom. There is one for the queen mother as well. We'll talk about that later. I forgot to say we're going to get my tablet later. Look at pictures. We'll talk about um, that ceremony a little bit later. It's known as Langa. But um, during this year of Nkwala, um, the king, he was... Um, oh, I didn't write down his name. Um, Swati II, I believe. Anyway. Um, he actually died while he was dancing during Nkwala. And the next in line... King Sobuza II was only four months old, and that officially made him the youngest crowned monarch in history, apparently. And um, so th th that was a lot to happen, right? There's like a huge war going on. The king dies. The next king is literally an infant. So um, in 1903, Swaziland became a British protectorate and was ruled over by the British mainly. In 1921, uh, King Sobuza II was officially crowned, now that he was an adult, and he initiated a lot of reforms. Eswatini was still very much a, like, stick hut, hunting, very, um, sort of like tribal still country, so he put in a lot of modernization schools and roads and hospitals and all the things that a modern country would need and um, one very important thing that's really I think underrated in his history is that he did a lot to keep British influence out of Swaziland because he knew what the British would do and that is to gobble up Swaziland and absorb it into their territory here in South Africa and he kept them away from it and maintained his kingdom. And later, much, much later in the 1960s, um, he was still king. He, he ruled for almost 83 years. He's the longest reigning monarch in history, in like human history. Um, he started to implement a couple of new reforms. In 1964, there was a new constitution that eliminated political parties and put a lot more political influence on the king. Um, but he died in 1982. And in 1986, King Mswati III was crowned, and he is still the king today. I'll talk about him a little bit more in a second. Oh, I skipped over independence. <laughs> My bad. So, the Constitution, 1964, they declared independence on September 6, 1968. And then in 1982, King Sobuza II skipped over that important part in my notes. I apologize. But yeah, they declared independence. And it was widely recognized. Um, the 1990s was a pretty rough time in Swaziland. They were hit extremely hard by the HIV AIDS epidemic. And to this day, they have the largest population of HIV positive people per capita. It is a real health crisis in Eswatini, especially back then. Um, there, there's a lot going on to help people who are HIV positive or are suffering from the AIDS virus today. But you can imagine how bad it was in the 1990s. And it was also during that decade that a lot of protests for reforms started to occur because people wanted a democracy. They didn't want an absolute king, especially since King Swati III is pretty corrupt. He really loves his fancy cars, fancy everything, you know, he lives a life of luxury while most of his people live in like stick huts, you know, not so much anymore, especially in the cities, but definitely out in the countryside. And, you know, some people don't have clean water, access to schools or health facilities, things like that. Meanwhile, he's living a luxurious life with all of his like wives and children and all that. So, um, 
That's when the movement for democracy began. It was King Mswati III that renamed the country to Eswatini in 2018, the 50th anniversary of independence. Yeah, 50th anniversary. Just so it was more um, culturally accurate to the name. Swaziland is kind of a colonizer name, you know. And also he was concerned about people confusing Swaziland with Switzerland. I, I guess, you know, whatever. So, uh, meanwhile, these protests are still going on, and in June 2021, they turned violent. People were getting incredibly upset, and, um, you know, protesters were fired on, the king allegedly fled the country, and it's kind of been going on ever since. It's still kind of, it's not like um, an incredibly violent, turbulent rebellion kind of thing. It's not like guerrilla movements are rising up. But it is definitely like the most turbulent period in Eswatini's history since independence, for sure. And um, we don't know what's going to happen. The king is very adamant on keeping his position as king. And, um, you know, we'll have to see where Eswatini goes in its history, I suppose. It's kind of a, a big moment in its history right now. It could either go one way or it could go the other. It could either drastically change or stay the same. Either way, we'll have to see what happens to Eswatini in the future. So let me turn out the lights and grab my tablet and we'll look at some gorgeous pictures of Eswatini. All right. Got you really up close. So let me zoom out so you can see exactly where Eswatini is located in Africa. You can see right down there in the south zoom in carefully and let me pull up some pictures so here's some sweet elephants a rhino they have black and white rhinos in Eswatini gorgeous scenery isn't that beautiful ancient ancient rocks beautiful waterfalls the rainforest and the cities all throughout zebras a big city and the gorgeous countryside. Lioness. Sorry, I'm probably going too fast. But we'll look at the mist. Lovely. So let me actually let me go to oop. I won't take this with you. Not my soda. Let me show you Osane National Park real quick. Show you some beautiful pictures of it's where it's located. And it's a really gorgeous place, the Hlani Royal National Park. It's a big giraffe's rhinos. If you know me, you know I love my animals, so I gotta show you the animals, right? Oh look, there's an elephant skull right there. Oop. There we go. Some sweet rhinos, a big lion. And sweet little elephants. Oop. Probably these guys, right? Oh, how amazing. Oh, I want to go to a safari so bad. Because, you know, there's a big elephant skull. You know, I love my animals, and especially elephants. But it's a very, very beautiful place. Let me show you some of the cities before we look a little bit more at nature. So, here's Mbabane official capital city. Let me zoom out a bit so I can tap this so we can see some pictures of Mbambane. Yeah, we saw a couple of these. Oh, how pretty. It does have some really gorgeous scenery around it. A couple of little landmarks that I'll show you in a minute. But as you can see, a big busy city. was um, doing some street view before filming this, checking out the area, and there are some gorgeous homes up in the hills. My gosh, some of them look like, oh, that's a neat building. Look like they could be found, like, where I live in California. They're really beautiful. 
So there's Mpambani. We're gonna go a little farther south to is this it? Here's the airport. We have two airports, so maybe let me zoom out a bit. Did I get lost? There's Manzini, so it's over here. I want to show you all the royal parks and stuff. There it is, Lopop. Lopop. So, this is the King Sopuza II Memorial Park. There's a little statue of him. The National Museum is right next door to it. <laughs> Casino is there as well. Better picture of his statue. Can you see? Let me move this down. Oop. I have no enemy. <laughs> Very interesting. There we go. That's a better shot. This little memorial park and the museum. Okay. Let me. Oh, we're almost done. That was the former king, right? Let me show you the museum. If we can find it. Let's look around. Oh, here we go. Points of interest. We'll look at the wildlife sanctuaries in a minute. There's the Memorial Park. The National Museum. There we go. Swaziland National Museum. So there's the park where we're looking at all the pictures of the king. And here is the National Museum. So, I think this is the right slideshow. Make sure you guys see. Um, there's a couple of um, traditional huts here. All the national parks have little areas where these huts are included, so you can see how people used to live, and sometimes still do. We got some animals. <laughs> Cute. Um, oh, isn't that interesting? some animal clothes, some of the um, traditional like fence barriers they'd build. There's a big map of Eswatini. That's neat. You can see the two mountain ranges in the valley in between. More animals. They're very traditional shields that you can see on their official flag. The spears. They use that during Kuala. So this is for the Mklani. And um, it's sort of like the male in Kuala. Mplane is when like all of the young unmarried women wear these traditional clothes and they carry these long reeds and do a special dance for the queen mother. Um, the princesses always participate. They wear special headdresses and I can't see any of them here. But um, The very controversial thing about it is that um, traditionally the women are topless, which um, you know, it's not like a sexualized thing or anything. It's just how their tradition has always been, right? Um, so it became an issue with YouTube a few years ago, um, where, you know, it was blocked for nudity, but, um, it's the one thing that has been, like, worked around. And I think if you look up videos of Mlane, um, there'll be, like, a disclaimer stating how it works, so... It's the one, oh, there's King Sobuza announcing independence. It's the, like, one instance. So here are some Nkwala outfits and their shields. There's a couple really neat videos. They, they had their Nkwala in December of 2021. And uh, it's beautiful. It's, it's such a neat ceremony. That's the Mklanga clothes again. Some of the king's cars. Isn't that funny? Let's see. This is. Um, oop, loud car outside. Dun, dun, dun. Anyway. Okay. Oh, that's the last picture. That's why. Okay. That's pretty much what I wanted to show you. So. Um. This would be like, like I said, the, the main 
city, right? Where the king lives and everything. I'll just show you that. And, um, oop. A little bit of a disaster. I wanted you to see some of, like, the neat hills and stuff around here. And let me show you if I can find it right here. See Baby Rock. Just a random place I found when I was exploring on Google Earth. One of the really neat natural landmarks. Isn't this beautiful? Oh my gosh. Southern Africa is something else, right? There's so many different um, like biomes and different environments in Africa, but I think Southern Africa So beautiful. Oh, we got some cows going down. Isn't that amazing? Some very ancient, ancient, ancient rocks. Oh my gosh, how vivid. Oh, rooster hurries outside. <laughs> some sweet cows, and this looks like a great place to take a hike, doesn't it? So anyway, I'm going to end it there for tonight. <laughs> the rooster's crowing. Thank you so much for watching. I do hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a very good, good, good night.